And hello everyone, we are live. This is the Game Ball Podcast, episode 80. Uh, my name's Liam, I'll be your host today as we bring you your weekly dose of lightning in a bottle. I'm going to introduce the cast real quick, uh, but if you don't know, we are the Game Bowl. We talk about video games, and we review them, provide interesting features on them, and generally just try to create an interesting dialogue to get people talking. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce Kyle. Hello. And we also have with us Thomas. Hello. How are you guys doing today? Pretty good? Pretty good. I'm, of course, just peachy. Peachy, just like like the yep. like the fruit, or is that a vegetable? Is that a fruit or vegetable? That's Peach. a fruit. Fruit. Peach is right. a fruit. <laughs> so it's like a tomato case. Um, no, unfortunately. But we, so if you don't know about our Twitch channel, we're streaming on Twitch at twitch.tv/slash the Game Board every Tuesday night, and the podcast posts to iTunes every Wednesday, YouTube every Thursday. Real quick. As we always like to do, we're going to get into what we are playing. So, Kyle, I would like you to go first. What you playing right now? All right. So, I've been playing Dragon Quest VIII. I picked it up for the 3DS a couple of days ago. And I've been quite enjoying it. It's definitely Dragon Quest. And basically, if you don't know what Dragon Quest is, it's essentially old-school classic Final Fantasy with Akira Toriyama's um, art style. And... I've heard this is, like, the longest Dragon Quest at, like, over 100 hours if you're, um, want to, like, you know, do everything that you want to do in the game. And so it's kind of an undertaking. <laughs> and I've al- I'm already about 16 hours in, and I'm already kind of seeing how going 100 hours could get kind of tedious and monotonous, especially if the game has a lot of backtracking. But as far as the game itself, I'm, like, really enjoying it, and especially the premise. Like, in Dragon Quest Seven, you're, of course, um, play as these heroes, and his friends go on an adventure. That's pretty much, um, um, like, the go-to story for JRPG. Um, and, but the twist is that um, instead of, like, going on an adventure, you go into the past and basically save these islands that don't exist in the present, and when you save them, um, they just pop up in present time and at peace. So, and essentially, these islands are pretty much, um, they all have their self-contained story. Most of them are based on, like, fables and classic literature, like Romeo and Juliet and just, like, Aesop's fables and stuff. So it's, like, um, it's heavily inspired by Chrono Trigger. Going into the past... Saving something and that appears in the present day. Like that? Yeah, kind of. Yeah, pretty much. As far as that goes. And so, really, as far as like being 16 hours into it, the plot, the plot hasn't really progressed whatsoever. But really, you just go island to island and they have their own stories and you go to the next island. Eventually, I suppose, it'll start to kind of, like, roll out, and the plot will actually start to get deeper. Because I've heard a lot of people consider Dragon Quest Seven like, the best Dragon Quest. Oh, wow. So, it's got to it's gotta be good at something. <laughs> yeah, good at something, um, but it's the best. Can't just exist. Yeah, and, yeah, but I'm definitely, I'm definitely finding it pretty intriguing, and I'm, like, really enjoying it. It's, like... So cool to like go back to playing like a classic JRPG with um, turn-based combat. So, are the characters completely different across uh, each Dragon Quest? Um, as far as the main cast, yeah, but they're pretty stereotypical. So, are you looking to finish as many as possible before Dragon Quest Eleven, Kyle? Um, not really. I mean, I I want to go and visit some of the previous Dragon Quest games, because I, I played Dragon Quest Eight a couple weeks ago, I didn't get too far into it, and so I was really excited to play Dragon Quest Seven because I, of course, I love Akira Toriyama's art style, so I'm, like, all for that, of course, I love classic Final Fantasy, and so I'll probably go back to um, revisit some older Dragon Quest games to try those out, and 
yeah, definitely looking forward to Dragon Quest XI, and hopefully someday, if ever, Dragon Quest X comes out westward. That'd be awesome. That, uh, that's the MMO, right? Yeah. Yeah, I have no idea if that could even come out west anymore. But who knows? Um, I mean, uh, Final Fantasy XIV oh, yeah. originally started out in uh, Japan and then it moved over here. Yeah, and it's probably one of Square Enix's most successful Final Fantasies. That is a good point. Um, it seems like they're trying some interesting stuff with their long-standing properties like Hitman and Dragon Quest. At least, I don't know, maybe an MMO might be the wrong way to go with Dragon Quest, but like you said, XIV's probably one of their most successful Final Fantasies in a long time, so it could come over here and find new life. I feel like though you would have to kind of almost slow down or cancel uh, 14 and and then bring over Dragon Quest XI, just because that MMO space is so competitive. Yeah, I mean, there's also to consider that Dragon Quest is more niche than Final Fantasy. Yeah, and yeah like, a lot. Yeah, you like your description, <laughs> Kyle, it did sound like a lot more niche than Final Fantasy. Um, I mean, Dragon Quest is older than Final yeah, Fantasy. Yeah, it is. So there's that too, <laughs> and it has it like unlike Final Fantasy, it hasn't changed its formula whatsoever in the mainline series, except for of course ten and eleven. It's like a stubborn old man. Uh, <laughs> but to keep on going, uh, Thomas, what are you playing? What have you been up to? Well. Obviously, as everyone knows, Rise of Iron came out today for Destiny, and I picked that up pretty quick. Uh, I'm liking it so far. I played about three missions into the story. Uh, I haven't gotten super deep into it yet. Um, so far, what I can say is, like, story, I liked uh, Taken King a little better, uh, because I think uh, Oryx, Oryx really made Taken King, like, such... Oryx was like a, a figurehead antagonist for that game for that uh, expansion and this time it doesn't seem to have that this time around they met uh, i think rasputin is gonna if you if you played destiny before rasputin is the war mind on earth um that i believe protects the what's left of the earth's um infrastructure uh i i'm i'm not entirely sure i've never I think been that like super right. yeah yeah i've never been super uh, into the Destiny lore before Taken King, so I wouldn't be able to tell you exactly how Rasputin fits, fits into the bigger picture. Uh, they mentioned him in passing in one of the cutscenes I saw so far, but um, as to what the, the what everyone's been looking forward to is the raid, I wouldn't be able to tell you exactly how the raid's going to play out yet. I don't know what the boss is going to be. I don't know what, it, what, what where it's even going to take place. But I'm really looking forward to it. I know a lot of people. I I know some people that are probably gonna. Uh, pro I can probably raid with, and I'm really excited for it. Cool. Yeah, I hope to pick up Destiny. Oh, I have Destiny. I hope they try to get back into it or play with it for a little, just because I like those guns. I like that first-person feel that Bungie has pretty much mastered over the years. Yeah, Rise of Iron um, doesn't do anything to the like the standard Destiny formula so far that that Taken King set, but uh, other than introducing new areas, new gear, new enemies, but um, I'm enjoying it so far. I'm gonna be playing a lot more tomorrow, and I'm gonna get as far as I can, get my light level as high as I possibly can, and uh, hopefully a guide will come out for the raid before I start it because I don't know. I'll probably take a few hours if I go in there blind. I don't think I'm gonna come out come out on one piece in the end yeah um, and also you also have down you're playing another game uh could you go on to your talk about your second game you put down yes so i recently recently picked up the new ratchet and clank and it's just called it's just called that ratchet and clank because it's supposed to be a reboot and i used to play ratchet and clank all the time as a kid i played um going i never played the original but i played going commando and i played um up your arsenal and those I had like so much fun playing those as a kid. And um, as everyone knows, the the franchise sort of fell off after those after uh, Up Your Arsenal. And like especially the PS, like the PS3 ones weren't as well yeah. liked, right? Yeah. 
the people didn't like the PS3 ones, and then there was the uh, it was like the all for one game, which was like a four player co op Ratchet and Clank, and everyone was like, we we don't yeah. we don't want this, <laughs> we want Ratchet and Clank, and um, this one is probably the best Ratchet and Clank six since Up Your Arsenal. It's wow. it's absolutely, yeah. and that's. Like precisely why they named it Ratchet and Clank because they want they wanted like a big return to form kind of game, and I was like oh, I was late to the train on this one because like Ratchet and Clank completely fell off my radar after um I think the last one I played was Deadlocked which was immediately after Up Your Arsenal and I didn't really care for it. I really and like Deadlock personally. That was, that's, Deadlock was the arena, right? Or am I thinking of yes. something? Yeah, I played that. That was fun. It was good. I think but... I, I think I knew game. Plus that game, I think about four or five times. <laughs> yeah, wow. <laughs> I uh, I thought it was good. I thought it was uh, all right. Um, it wasn't. I thought uh, I new game plus uh, up here Arsenal probably like the same amount of times. I played that. I played that one in the ground. I didn't think Deadlocked was as good as up here Arsenal. But um, so like yeah, once the PS3 games came out, everyone's like, well, it's not really a good ratchet. And then this one. This game is I I com- since I completely missed it um, when it came out I didn't even know I was listening to like um, kind of funny like uh, um, like a week and a half ago and they, and they were talking about the new Ratchet and Clank game and I was like oh yeah didn't I I remember hearing something about that it completely flew under my radar and then I rent I rented the game I was like wow this is a really good Ratchet and Clank game I'm really glad they decided to go back and take what they what everyone loved about the franchise and making it into a good game again like um all the uh, all the different weapons and all the different like um upgrades that you can get for the weapons and then the different like the funny characters and the like the good like the good overall plot and um the charm and stuff yeah and they brought back dr nefarious which is like the best ratchet and clank villain by far he's the, like it's if you ever played um if you ever played up your arsenal, <laughs> that game is so funny, and I think they're do- they're doing it really well. They're playing up the humor really well this time around too. Um, the only complaint, like it, the only complaint I have is it's just not enough. They yeah. they yeah, it's a forty dollar game, which is like which should tell you that you know the game isn't as extensive as you would expect a sixty dollar game to be, mm. but um. But honestly, they're heading in a great direction. And if yeah. they keep, keep up, if they take what they did here, just make it bigger next game, like next uh, iteration, it would be great. It would be, I think it could be just as good as Up Your Arsenal was back in the day. Yeah, I, I think that it, as a remake of the first game, it's a bit underwhelming. Um, its story, and compared to the first game, isn't that good. It's not that fleshed out, in my opinion. Some people might disagree with me. But as a new Ratchet and Clank game, I think it's, like, superb. And the graphics and everything are just amazing. Oh, yeah. It's a, you got a huge graphical up- update from um, from what I remember. I'm going off my memories of um, Up Your Arsenal because I didn't play any of the PS3 games. But... I think it's. I think it looks great. I think it plays well. They got they got tons of cool weapons to play with and tons of like collectibles to go and get. They really nailed down what um, they finally they finally made a good Ratchet and Clank game, and it's really satisfying. And I hope that they uh, continue in that direction. Yeah, and it really plays on nostalgia. <laughs> mm-hmm. I feel like just from the sales and the critical reception, that it's almost inevitable that Sony's going to at least try to get that same Insomniac team to develop a Ratchet and Clank sequel. At least one more. Because that game came out probably... That game came out like April, right? Uh, I, I think I so. Think around that time. Pretty sure it was a- I think it was April or March. Yeah, because like right around Dark Souls. and Yeah, and I totally missed it. Yeah, and they sold so many, but they, it was a $40 game. It sounds like, from how you guys are describing it, that it may not... That the development costs may have been more appropriate to a forty dollar game. That they could sell more copies at forty dollars because their development costs weren't as high, even though yeah. it does well, look like a very pretty expensive looking game. It does. It does look very. It looks very nice. But um, in terms of raw content, there's not as much as you would expect mm, okay. from a 
like a full a uh, full sixty dollar game of like up your arsenal just has more content okay. than this. Um, yeah, you could probably beat the remake in about six eight hours, and compared to the first game, you could probably beat it in about thirteen to fourteen hours. Yeah, so, so it's it's, it's good, shorter. Yeah, it's a bit uh, shorter than the original game. Yeah, so which is why they decided to go with forty dollars. Um, it is the way based I, on the, a movie, after all. <laughs> it it is. That's right. Um, the movie. I, I never saw the movie. I wouldn't be able to tell you anything about it. But um, what it felt like to me was a test run to get to um, to see if they could do it. If, to see if they could do it and like get, get back yeah. to the original for, Ratchet and Clank form. And they did it, and they did it really well. And I think this is great. A great indication for awesome Ratchet and Clank games that we could get in the future. Yeah, definitely, and from what I know, it sold pretty well. I mean, it was number one on Amazon um, in games for about a week when it came out, so. Oh, yeah, it's, it's really good. Any Ratchet and Clank fans out there should absolutely go get, go get it. If you yeah, remember it's playing great. This game, if you remember playing this game as a kid, like, if you remember Ratchet and Clank as a kid, I guarantee you, you will enjoy this one. Cool, cool. Sounds great. And I will just touch on, uh, real quick, the game I'm playing. Uh, I finished, I played Arkham Knight when it came out last year, but I never went around and I never finished it on, um, I never finished it on Nightmare, which is the new game Plus, and I went and I've been working on it for like the past few days and I finished on New Game Plus. Uh, it was, I still, I still liked it. I still really enjoy Batman Arkham Knight. I see more flaws, but I also see more things I appreciate about it. Um, but, and I started The Walking Dead Season 2, because I'm debating on getting Season 3, but Season 3, like the Michonne series, they're starting to intersect with the comics, and I'm nowhere near as far as they are in the comics, uh, to... Where the Walking Dead I doubt it. Be. I'm, I, it'll probably be way back to like season one, where it's pretty self-contained. Yeah, yeah. The, like pro- it might have like a cameo, like the first season did with Gwen. But the only reason I'm a little more skeptical is because, from what I understand, of Michonne, Michonne disappears at some point in the comics, and then she reappears, and the the mini series was made in collaboration with Skybound, the pub, the creative team behind The Walking Dead, and they basically that game is basically what happens in that time gap. That's the only reason I'm a little more wary, is if they start tying stuff together more now that they tried after they tried it with Michonne. Maybe. Yeah. I mean, it's going to focus on Quimentine again, so... That's I, true. And she's not really in the comics. It'll, yeah. No, I don't think she's in the comics at all, is she? Not that I know of. I mean, she could be. They could add her any minute now. Yeah, I, 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 could see, I could see her... I, I could see them adding her to the comics, so she is a great character. Um, do we know if uh, people are liking the new uh, episode 2 of Batman? I think yeah, it's got some pretty good reviews. It seems I've the... heard so, I've heard some say that it's not as good as the first episode. But I haven't tried it yet, so yeah, I just heard the I saw a review that said it was better than the first one, and I've just basically read the through line is that it's just, it's pretty good. Uh, but it's just like it's like a solid entry, you know. Yeah, Nothing that good. stands out that much. Yeah, yeah. It's not, I've been like the I've first been meaning... episode didn't impressed me as far as Telltale goes, but it was yeah. okay. I've been meaning to get back into Telltale games. I've um, I've only played The Walking Dead season one and a little a little bit of the Game of Thrones series, but uh, I really want to. I have um, Tales from the Borderlands on my wish list for Steam, and I'm planning on getting that soon. Plan through that. <laughs> ever since I played, ever since I've played um, Life is Strange and Oxen Free, haven't really had any care to go back to Telltale. <laughs> you like that engine? Life is engine Strange is great too. <laughs> yeah. Life but, is Strange was the um, Square Enix's first attempt at something like that, and they I think they hit it out of the park. It was a great game. 
So, yeah. <laughs> All right, sounds good. Well, it looks like we went over what we were playing. Now we are going to head into the new storm. Uh, cue every single lightning noise you can think of. Every little mini tornado. I don't know. Do tornadoes make noises, or do you just imagine Dorothy, Dorothy, being screamed? Um. Ooh, whistling. That's good. That's probably yeah. That, more that's um, that was my tornado. <laughs> All right, so I had, to we... I had to prepare for that. That's why you had to pause. <laughs> All right, so first off, we are going to get to a delay that is probably going to bum some people out. But South Park, the fractured butthole, has been delayed to 2017. It was originally slated to come out at the end of this year in December, but the new release date is Q1 2017. Uh, this would make the release occur sometime between January and March. Uh, no specific date has been revealed, but to give you a heads up to what's coming already in Q1, uh, the NX, that's when it is rumored to be out by the end of March. Um, Horizon, Ze Horizon Zero Dawn is, the, is February 28th, 2017. Persona 5 is February is February 14th. February 14th, which is Valentine's Day, and Resident Evil 7. I want to make sure I have this correct. It's January 24th, 2017. So three huge games and a huge new launch of a console are joining. It, South Park is joining that. So the beginning of 2017 is already pretty jam-packed. Uh, thoughts on this delay? Does it free up some space for you guys this winter? Um, my winter wasn't looking horribly crowded at the moment. Um, but, you know, I think uh, if they thought they needed the time, more uh, more power to do them. Absolutely. Take your time and make your game better if you think you can do that. Uh, I don't think they're going to have any trouble competing with those big releases when they come yep. out uh, because it's South Park is the, the oh yeah it's it's fantastic it's like everyone loved um, Stick of Truth and it's like it's a completely different series like it's not even in the same genre as any of those three other games that you listed yeah it's not even close so it's like it'll fill a, it'll fill an absolute different need than what people are you know what experience what they might want from those other three games like Persona um, so yeah I. I I don't think it's going to be a problem at all. What about you, Kyle? Were you, you, were you going to play I'll South Park? That's great. Oh, sorry, Thomas. No, I mean... No, I it's never, okay. I I stuttered. I never really watched South Park. I mean, I watched an episode when I was younger, and it completely creeped me out, so I never <laughs> really watched South Park. I mean, I've been meaning to get to it eventually, but... So I, I've heard really good things about Stick of Truth, but at the same time I haven't played that, and I'm not, like, a fan of South Park yet, so I don't really see a point getting the um, fractured butthole. So. I, um, yeah, I didn't watch South Park at all either before I played uh, Stick of Truth. So Stick of Truth was my very first experience with any sort of, like, thing South Park related, and I thought it was hilarious and i thought it was you know it was still even on top of all that humor it was still a good game it's still a good rpg yeah i was shocked that they announced a sequel because uh matt and trey not only have south park but then they also developed book of mormon i'm not familiar with that one okay let me uh well the book of mormon is a broadway show and it's one of the most commercially successful Broadway shows and like, well, not not now because of Hamlet, but it's one of the most commercially successful Broadway shows ever. Um, and I was just sure they were going to work on stuff that wasn't South Park that was like even bigger than TV. More movie stuff, like movie stuff. And then they came up with a sequel to Stick of Truth. And I was just kind of shocked when they revealed it last year at E3. Uh, so, is Book of, Book Book of Mormon is... It's a religious satire musical about oh okay yeah two Mormons in I think they're in South Africa but basically they come across warlords and it's just Matt Stone and Trey Parker just 
and this great big religious satire, very commercially success- successful musical. Um, yeah, I've um, that sounds interesting to me. I'm I'm totally curious how uh, how they'll do the hu- how they would do the humor in that um, because you know people who go to Broadway to watch you know musicals and um, other dramas aren't necessarily the same people that are watching yeah. South Park. So it's like two completely different audiences. And I'm curious as to see if like the same type of humor that you would see in South Park is in that, in, in that play. Yeah. And it just gives you that insight into their ear for humor and how their minds are like developing projects and really working to create, to, not really create expectations, but to supplant your expectations when you go and see a show or watch a TV show, yeah. Uh, but I was really I could totally to South Park. Yeah, I can just totally see someone, you know, rich and you know. Well, I'm not. I'm not trying to generalize here or anything, but I can see someone walking out of a South Park play slash musical, thinking, "Oh, well, that was so cross, and yeah. <laughs> it was." It was completely uncalled for though that type of humor i will take my business elsewhere and just like i'm just curious i'm I'm, now you made me really curious i really want to go see that play just to see the type of humor that they would involve uh but moving along a little bit as much as i'd love as much i would love to talk about the book of mormon um we also last week was tokyo game show and we received some death stranding details kojima talked a little bit about his new game i kind of wish he wouldn't but he decided to anyway (laughs) uh he said that it'll come out in 2018 he didn't really say it like that i'll get into that more in a second um he also spoke that it will be open world and that there'll be a different kind of online play than we've seen before uh, he also spoke that you will make. I'm gonna make sure I have this correctly. Uh, but the game will have a female protagonist who will join Norman Reedus's unnamed main character, and uh, he also. <laughs> and I, see, I did. I'm reading this now just to make sure everything right. But it says that the character designer Yoji Shinkawa, who's also worked with Kojima before. <laughs> So the Death Stranding will include mechs in some form. Uh, so mechs, open oh. world, female male protagonist, Norman Reedus, open world, uh, co-op. What do you guys think so far of Death Stranding? We'll start with Kyle. <coughs> so it looks like it's starting to shape up to be Silent Hills and Metal Gear Solid had a baby. <laughs> with, and it was in space. <laughs> And tons and tons of whales. Yeah. Do you think he'll be out by 2018? It just depends. I know Kojima likes to put a lot of work and effort into his games. And all the Metal Gear Solid games have had a pretty long um, development cycle. So it could come out like way in 2018, but I don't think it will. I think we're looking more at like a late 2019, early 2020 release but who really knows they he could have like a bigger team than he did at konami yeah what about you thomas are you a hideo kojima fan um yeah i i'm gonna be honest i've never i've only played um metal gear solid 5 i haven't had the chance to play any of the earlier ones but he i think it's pretty i i definitely respect what he's done with the franchise but um I think 2018. I I kind of agree with Kyle. I think 2018 is a little ambitious, but I'm not, you know, privy to any information or like, about his team or about how like, um, how professional and how quickly those people can you know, churn churn uh, a project like this out. But I do want to say it, it really depends. It all it all boils down to how ambitious it's gonna the project is gonna be. If it's gonna be anything like completely out of this world which you know i would expect someone like kojima to do then Mm. 2018 probably is i i don't see it happening i know he said 2018 he's probably hoping for 2018 but i think 2019 is more ambitious i mean sorry it's more uh realistic uh 
it's it's weird to talking about a game that's been announced and just the, the potential release date is so far away. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah <laughs> even the, it's just we'll get Final Fantasy 15. Yeah, and it's like what he said about you know even though he told us things like it's open world and you know the female and we're gonna have a female protagonist, we still don't know anything about it. We it's we a, just we don't know anything about the game. I don't really, know. Really, Death Stranding's probably only still in concept right now. It's probably not in active development. Yeah, which yeah. makes me he- which would if I was in charge of that project, it would make me very very hesitant to like say a, a potential release date that far away. I but, think something like that is very difficult to predict. But this I don't is also think you his... should. I... Oh, you can go, Kyle. Sorry, didn't mean to interrupt. I, um... Personally, I don't think Kojima should have had announced it at this E3, but because it's pro- like it'll probably be a while before we really get anything tangible about the game. And it'll be years until it finally releases, like 2019 to 2020. So it's just like <clears throat> they pulled a Square Enix, and now it's like it. It, since it's a Kojima game, it'll hold like a lot of hype. At the same time, it's just like I don't want to wait for years for a game that's already announced that I know will probably be amazing because Kojima's working on it. You know. Yeah, I think he's also very well aware of his position and the fact that he can say whatever he wants because he's Kojima and like, what's <laughs> Sony gonna do? Sony gonna fire him? He's literally the most well-known video game developer in the industry. So yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, so of, I think he. Yeah. Go, go ahead. Yeah, I know he's so well known. Part of me thinks that Death Stranding conceptually has been. Is. So when so, Norman Reedus was interviewed a few months ago. I think it was, it was by a magazine. It wasn't by a video game website. But they asked about the, f- the cancellation of Silent Hills, and he was like, "Yeah." me and Del Toro and Kojima definitely have to get together again and make something because we didn't just talk about Silent Hills. We talked about a lot of stuff. And I bet Death Stranding is conceptually a lot more concrete than we think it is. It just sounds like Kojima as an exercise to keep himself creatively fresh and creatively... And not make sure he isn't as stagnant, that he's always kind of... He's always fleshing out the next thing after Metal Gear, and he's wanted to make a non-Metal Gear game for like a decade. Uh, so I feel like while he doesn't know how it's actually going to play, that the story, the themes, the world, I bet it's a lot. it's been a lot further along than we actually realize. Yeah. But he also, Kojima yeah, also he likes to do this Yeah, probably has it like, all so. figured out. Yeah. Well, I'd say more figure. I'd say it's... He isn't just. I'd say <laughs> that he's right. He has new material, but he's also he's familiar with this. He's like pulling out of a drawer and saying, "Hey, I've always thought about this. Let's go forward with this story." Yeah, yeah. he's a pretty detail-oriented writer, so. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's like a great opportunity for him to try new things. He's been working on Metal Gear for the past. Was it like the what the better part of a decade of his life? So almost thirty years. Yeah, yeah. Thirty? Thir- uh, I'm gonna try to see. Let me see. Let's look this. Because up. the first Metal this. Gear game that he worked on, which was of course the original Metal Gear, was back on the MSX, which was like late eighties. Let's see. Wow, that'll be a long time. Wow. Um. Yeah. He. Yeah, he worked as a designer on the original Metal Metal Gear with the MSX. Oh, wow. So, yeah, about 30 years. Yeah, 29. <laughs> uh, Metal Gear Solid 1 was released in 1998. Uh, there is a... There's a smaller series of games. Metal Gear... For, oh, okay. Yeah, it's a... Uh, for the Konami M- and for the MSX2 computer, uh, they're kind of like re- I really don't know how to describe them because I've only seen them how they play, but they're like, um, if you take the, it's kind of like that computer, that smaller, uh, 
style where you can only really fit like like two tanks and like a bunch of walls and the bad guys. Uh, oh, okay. Well, I didn't know about that. Um, and yes, yeah, I, mean, I should say Metal Gear Solid was a sequel to Metal Gear Two. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, um. So yeah, he's been working on Metal Gear for a really long time. So yeah, it must be it must feel good for him to, you know, branch out and do something new. I'm sure. <laughs> and before we go over the August NPD, we are going to go over what we are going to talk about. Uh, pretty big news. Uh, it just the Pokemon CEO spoke today. He was adding more fuel to the NX console handheld hybrid speculation. Basically what he said, and I'm not sure, I'm not sure if you guys have been following this, he spoke to the Wall Street Journal, and he reiterated that the NX, and I'm quoting this, the NX is trying to change the concept of what it means to be a home console device or a handheld console, um, and that the Pokemon company will be making a Pokemon game for the console. Uh, so, what were your initial reactions to this? And uh, we'll go over the second part I wanted to bring up soon. But uh, what were your initial reactions to this when you heard um, that the Pokemon Company is making a Pokemon game for the NX? I mean, I appreciate it because uh, people have wanted Pokemon on a console for years and years now. So, it'll be cool. And But as far as, like, um, basically them confirming that the NX is a console mobile hybrid, um, I just hope that doesn't turn out to be, like, really gimmicky, like the Wii, Wii and the Wii U. And it's accessible, um, because the Wii and the Wii U weren't really accessible to me as a person who has difficulty playing um, games with bigger controllers. So, um... But yeah, I'm definitely interested in them um, coming out with Pokemon on the console instead of on the 3DS again. Um, well, when they say Pokemon on console, we've had Pokemon games yeah. on console yeah. before. So they're just not traditional Pokemon games. Yeah. Pokemon Stadium, Pokemon Snap, Pokemon Coliseum. So like, those are all Pokemon games on console, but they're not traditional Pokemon games. You know, gather your eight badges, go defeat the Elite Four, and then yeah. eventually the champion. So, I mean, it could event, it could wind up being, you know, a fully fleshed out, you know, standard Pokemon game. I'm doubtful it will with um, Sun and Moon on the horizon already. To and then to like create other otherwise otherwise they would have to go back to a previous generation of Pokemon and start, you know, I'm curious that I think a Pokemon a revised Pokemon Adventure in Kanto on console, I think would be really cool, and I think I think fans fans of Pokemon would absolutely absolutely jump on board for that. And if it's really good, it could it could be in an X console seller. Um, yeah, like a remake of um, like Red and Blue. That would be like yeah, a fully three D. Yeah, ab absolutely, a fully three D remake of Red and Blue on console. Would, pro would sell the NX. That would probably put the NX on the board, and it would be a huge cash cow for Nintendo. As long as they don't, as long as they stick to the traditional formula, they can absolutely rake in the money on the nostalgia train. Um, if as to whether it could be a game like Pokemon Coliseum, which I thought was actually a pretty good Pokemon game, despite it not being traditional, I. Think they could still? I think it could still work out really well for them. Yeah, I feel like they're very careful with the wording because while it does seem that the 3DS is in the twilight, is twilight years. If the NX doesn't, people don't buy it. There's still what over still tens of millions, at least a still tens of millions of 3DSs out in the wild. Mm -hmm. So you don't like, paint yourself in the corner that hey we're just going NX exclusive. Yeah. Even like Nintendo. Po yeah, but I know. Yeah. Sorry. Like Nintendo, they, they they just they they have the cornerstone on, um, you know the handheld market. Other than Vita, they have no competition, and the Vita doesn't. As much as like some of us do like Vita, uh, it just doesn't hold a candle to the 3DS and its games. 
So the the idea that they might merge their handheld and their console together would be really interesting to me because that would mean that they wouldn't release a new handheld. They would just release the NX. And I'm that whole idea completely boggles my mind because I don't know if that could be a genius business move or a complete flop. I don't know if people are going to get angry that, you know, I don't want to buy a full console for to be able to play a handheld game or if they're going to go the complete opposite direction. I think it's 100% unpredictable. I think I would probably buy it because that sounds like a really cool concept to me and if it would be if any of the console companies would be this innovative, it would probably be Nintendo. Yeah. So, yeah, that's my opinion on it. <laughs> Uh, you were saying, Kyle? Um, I was just agreeing with him. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I'd be interested. I mean, it really feels like the next step that they will have to do is a fully fledged Pokemon game for at least make it playable on your TV. Um, I don't know. It just it gets. I feel like it's getting to that point where like the Elder Scrolls V Skyrim Remastered, people are just relentlessly asking for a Pokemon game on your TV. Um, I've heard someone meant, I've read somewhere that someone said that this the, the NX sounds like a Super Game Boy if it goes back to cartridges and you can take it on the go. Um, but it also connects to your TV, that being the super part. Uh, I feel like if the name, which would be pretty smart in my opinion, to go back to the Game Boy, because of just of how successful that was, if that was the name, like a Super Game Boy or like a Game Boy X, I feel like... The Game Boy would, Extreme. Yeah, or <laughs> yeah, you would have to call, you would have that Pokemon on there, you know? Yeah, yeah it would. it would be a console mover. If it was that, a launch title, especially. And that would certainly correlate with a Red and Blue remake. <laughs> yeah, I, I would say that if they are working on a Pokemon game for the uh, NX, it wouldn't be it wouldn't be a new generation. It would be it would be either be a, a remake, like Red and Blue would probably be the go to option, or it would just be like a spin off, like Coliseum or. Um, Stadium. Yeah, I wouldn't want to be the guy to remake 800 Pokemon and like like Super HD 3D pixels for the NX. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would be that. That would be go if they did make it specifically for the NX. That would be quite the uh, quite the change from how easy it's developed for the 3DS to the NX. But are you, but in regards to the NX, there are a lot of rumors floating around today that, and I was reading various Twitter ports and accounts that said uh, Nintendo's in Germany, they're supp rumored to be asking retailers to sign NDAs, they're having a stream, and I've heard, and I, and I saw tweets that said a stream as early as Thursday or as late as sometime in October to officially reveal the NX via stream. I mean, it's about time. It was yeah. supposed to be announced back in March. That's when they said they were going to announce it was in March. They didn't. <laughs> yeah, I'm excited. I think they learned their lesson from the Wii U, and I think... Um, I hope. Yeah, I think they learned their <laughs> lesson. I, I, think, uh, I think they're going to do something really cool this time around. I think the NX is going to be something really innovative, and I'd, I'll probably wind up buying one this time. I passed on the Wii U, but we'll see how this goes. Yeah. Oh, man, you passed on the Wii U. You're missing Xenoblade Chronicles X and Tokyo Mirage Sessions. Are you doing oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, for all the <laughs> for all the flack that people give the Wii U, it does have good games. It has like really good games that um, you should absolutely try out. Like, uh, Smash Brothers is a must-play on that. Yeah. Yeah, um, and even, like you said, something new... I mean, 
just that whole just because how I would say relentless some people are on the internet usually can find out what a company's plans are for reveals um, so even just that you know hey we talked to retailers in Germany on a Tuesday and we have a stream planned out for next week I mean that's a lot different than the constant barrage of internet hints we've gotten over the years from different publishers like uh, Ubisoft and Square Enix. Uh, but any yeah. anyway, uh, moving on, we will we'll definitely be keeping up with that NX news because it is very interesting. Um, but the best-selling games of August 2016 have been revealed as the NPD Group's monthly sales report for both physical and digital sales have been made available to the general public. To, no, I'm sorry, they have been released. Uh, so in order, number one, and this is best-selling games in the U.S. for August 2016. Uh, so they would probably be different everywhere else. Uh, but one, they have Madden NFL 17. Uh, oh, two, boy. Yeah. <laughs> no Man's Sky. Three, oh, boy. Three... Deus Ex, Mankind Divided, and then nice. 4 through 10, and this is with the new information taken account, but 4 through 10 are all games, none of them are new releases. So 4 is GTA 5. Oh, it's, oh man, it's still in the top 10. That's yeah. crazy. 5 is Overwatch, <laughs> and that does not include Battle.net PC sales. 6 is Rainbow Six Siege. That game's still selling? Wow. Well, yeah, it's really good. Seven is Call of Duty Black Ops 3. Eight is Lego, Star Wars The Force Awakens. Nine's Minecraft, digital sales excluded. And then ten's Destiny The Taken King. I thought the whole world bought Minecraft already. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Minecraft world. will never Minecraft will never be taken off the top ten. No, people, people on will Mars be are buying it. People are still <laughs> buying that game every day. It doesn't matter how long ago it was released. And, like, Madden is totally understandable. I get that. And the only um, big release that came out in August was uh, Deus Ex, and that was number three. And that was a game that really only interested um, gamers who, you know, regularly play, regularly play video games. But Madden yeah. is a game that appeals to people that don't regularly play video games. So it's absolutely... Not surprising at all that that was number one. Yeah, that was yeah. My I'm thought. surprised. That, I'm kind of surprised that Deus Ex took the third spot because Deus Ex as a series is pretty niche. Yeah, I mean, it was still. Um, it wasn't super niche in my opinion. It was. I definitely agree that it it fills a void for specific types of people, and um, I still I still like. I wasn't super into Deus Ex, but I still bought it and I still enjoyed it. Yeah, between so, um, yeah. between the Square Enix's big three uh, non-Japanese franchises, Hitman, especially Hitman, especially after this year, how all that season pass is doing. Um, Tomb Raider. I haven't heard like really anything about Hitman. <laughs> yeah, I've heard. I've seen a lot of really good reviews, and a lot of just generally people like it. Uh, but between Hitman, yeah. Tomb Raider, and Deus Ex, I think Deus Ex is the hardest sell by far. It's so yeah. complex, but it's also so old. Because you go back and it's like, oh, it's a game from like the 90s-ish. Yeah, but it still not plays really. like one. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, but Deus Ex is not, a, is, is not like a household name. You can you can walk up to 10 people on the street and probably only 1 out of 10 would know what Deus Ex is. Tomb Raider, you go up to people and, you know. Angelina Jolie. Deus Ex, what are you talking about? What? Deus Ex, what are you talking about? I said, oh, yeah. But we have, but in sep but September alone, let's see, September video game releases, we have a few big releases, should have a few big releases, but uh, do you think any, what do you think is going to take the top spot in August, for September? Do you think it's still going to be Madden because we're in full-blown football season? Do you think Rise of Iron is going to sneak in there? What do you guys think? I think Madden's probably a safe bet. I think it's going to stay up there for a while. Yeah, it'll probably 
be Madden. Because there I mean, is too many big releases this month. I, I never play Madden. I've never played a Madden game in my life, and I, I, I still understand the power that that, that franchise holds. That in Call of Duty. It's yeah. sad. Yeah, there's like there's. <laughs> um, well, no, it's not sad. I mean, people people like the games they like. I mean, if you're casual, yeah. if you're a casual gamer and you just all you play is men Call of Duty, I know people like to make fun of those type of people on the internet. But like, who cares? Like, just let them play what they want to play. Yeah, there is. If you like it, play it. Yeah, FIFA is September twenty seventh, September 29th, So worldwide wise, it might crack the top 10 I don't know if three days is enough to get you in the top in to num- the number one spot but I think if uh, Final Fantasy 15 released in September like it was supposed to I think it might have, might have had a chance at the top spot yeah especially considering pre-orders <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah but it seems like I don't know September it's a bunch of sports games and there's destiny but besides that it's mostly like Bioshock a lot collection. Of Bioshock collection and Dead Rising, um, collection. Seems like just a lot of smaller indie games in September. Yeah, it wasn't. A, it was definitely not a big month. No, it was not. Yeah, last year just seemed so big because of gear, Metal Gear. Mm-hmm. October has. Sorry. What's the Horizon Free might get pretty up there. Oh, that is. Yeah, that is September. When's that release? Is that out now? 27th. 27th. There are, um, there's a couple big ones in, um, October, mainly Titanfall and Mafia 3 and World of Final Fantasy, but the bit, but once November kicks in, that's when the games start coming, and, like, some really big titles, like, that's Final Fantasy 15, that's Watch Dogs 2, it's Pokemon, Sun and Moon, and it's also Dishonored, and Call of Duty all in November. Yeah, October will be interesting because the you know, Battlefield and Titanfall 2 do. Uh, especially because they're from the same publisher. Um, yeah, I'm excited. Yeah, that'll be very interesting to see how those FPSs compete against each other. Uh, let's see. And we're going to talk real quick about uh, our game of the year right now. So it's, it's our last minute topic. We're going to talk about our game of the year so far before the fall rush comes. So September, things... Uh, have kind of slowed down a little, but right now, if the year were to end, what would be your games of the year? We'll, talk, we'll start with Kyle. Um, so, so far, my game of the year is still Oxen Free. so, um, of course, I played Uncharted 4, I think Uncharted 4 is amazing, but it's not my game of the year. Oxen Free is, because... I played Oxen Free knowing that it was going to be sort of like a Telltale game in a 2D scape. And it was going to be like sort of like a callback to like the Goonies and stuff and 80s um, tropes and stuff. And I played it and it was just, just like it was just so awesome. The soundtrack was great. The story was great. The characters were like so like awesome 80s stuff. And it was just like this is this is a great game. And... It still is, and I. It's right right now. Despite having played like quite a bit of AAA games so far this year, Oxen Three still takes the cake. That's impressive. It sticks out amongst all those AAA games. Um, but now Thomas, how about you? Um, honestly, the first game that came to mind was Overwatch. So far, if I, like if we're just stopping right now and saying every game that we played this year, I would say Overwatch because that game has you know I put over um, 200 hours into Overwatch already, and I've had a lot of fun as a, like a competitive for a competitive. It just scratched that itch for that competitive multiplayer game. Uh, you know, after I've played League of Legends for what was it like five years nonstop. Mm-hmm. Um, so it was just so much fun to try something different, and Overwatch is just like <laughs> it does. It does uh, hero diversity so well. All of the abilities for each cha- for each hero in that game are great. Each character's backstory is unique and fun, and every and even their like character design, their whole like, like their overall design is great. So and like that, and Overwatch is absolutely a game that appeals to kids and adults and it, it's it's great for all ages so i would say overwatch because 
know, and uh, no game has successfully sucked me in as much as O has. Yeah, I haven't. I played the beta. Um, I don't know if I'm actually gonna buy it, uh, but I would say probably my game of the year so far is Uncharted 4. I like the. I like. I don't. I didn't really dislike anything about it, uh, and that's kind of getting harder and harder as I play more games. Um, I like the story. I like the pacing. Uh, I liked how it was mature but not dark, and then when it was dark, it still was uncharted like. Um, <laughs> yeah. Like they still crack jokes. They still like, oh, it's a dead guy. Oh, look what happens when you poke when you take the when you poke his skeleton head. Um, <laughs> Soundtrack was great in Uncharted Four too. Yeah, uh, and I yeah. I really like playing Uncharted Four. I don't. I'm not a big shooter person. Like I don't. I'm not really interested in shooters, uh, and third person, I'm, I'm more interested in first person shooters than third person shooters, but even though Uncharted 4's mechanics are pretty simple and basic, I still like how they allow for really cool big explosive set pieces in that third person. Yeah, it was a great game. All I think, um, it's not my game leader, but I think it's absolutely a contender. Yeah. I think it's yeah, fantastic. If, if Octave Free didn't exist, it'd definitely be my current game leader. <laughs> yeah. I feel like um, I feel like Overwatch is going to get a lot of acclaim just because it's reminding so many people of that 2000 and when was it? I mean, it's a fresh competitive shooter. Modern Warfare. We yeah. Have, we haven't really had like a new um, competitive shooter well since Call of Duty 4. Yeah. That's basically yeah, it, what really. it was. It just took um, it took Team Fortress's two formula and just made it m more mainstream and like just it t it made a better formula and it just like it, they had the resources to to market this to as many people as possible and it, it and people just just loved it and mm -hmm. even like uh, today I saw a commercial for uh, a TBS is going to be showcasing the uh, the Overwatch. World Championships uh, next week for like a $300,000 prize. And Blizzard then, has like perfected making her games addictive. <laughs> oh yeah, They're, it's amazing how, what they, how, how they do that. I mean, WoW, Diablo, and now Overwatch, all free games are just, you can play for months and years and never get bored of them. Yeah. All right, well, it looks like uh, that's it. I think that's going to conclude our podcast today. I'd like to thank everyone who is listening and who tuned in. You can catch us once again at www.thegamebolt.com. And once again, the podcast goes on iTunes every Wednesday, and it goes into YouTube every Thursday. Uh, real quick, any recent stuff on the website you guys like to plug? Kyle? Thomas, anything? Um, I haven't written any. The last thing I wrote was uh, ten uh, ten RPGs that you can play for a hundred plus hours. Cool, cool. I think that's about a week old, week cool. week and a half old. Cool. So if anyone gets a chance, check out some RPGs that you may uh, want to take your time with. And what about you, Kyle? Anything you want to plug? I haven't had anything recently. No. Cool. All got right. some fain. I've got some fains in the rainer though, so that's cool. Good to hear. <laughs> and uh, you can find me and you and real quick, uh, can you guys do you uh, give us uh, uh, everyone your Twitter handles? Sure. Um, my Twitter handle is um, Guacdown RME. Um. Yep. And you can find me at uh, Tom Blaster. And I am Lee um, Neeson. And that'll be it for the Game Podcast episode eighty. Once again, I like thank everyone for tuning in and. See ya, and have a good night. Good night. See ya.